So, uh, before we get into your amazing career, here at Bonic Buzz, we're all about people's passion. I want to know where your passion for music came from. A certain album you listened to, or live performance inspired you to want to get into the music industry? I think it came from when I first heard The Doors, actually, because uh, they were, a, I'm a keyboard player, mm -hmm. and I just didn't really know what that sound was I was hearing on their records when I was a kid. And uh, it was this, you know, I was a piano player. My mom's a piano teacher, and my dad was a, you know, sort of a musician. But the real music wasn't, I would say, a major thing in our lives. It was sort of because my mom was a music teacher. I used to hear her play, like a lot of jazz stuff on the piano, and it just sort of filtered through. So when the Doors came out, a lot of their stuff was actually based on like two five progressions. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking, wow, I've heard that before, and I couldn't place why my favorite things sounded like Light My Fire. And then I found out that actually after meeting Manzarek, which was a great thing, yeah. he actually copied my favorite things for the Light My Fire solo section. So it was weird how it all went through my head sort of unconsciously, mm -hmm. that stuff. So then I ended up uh, joining a band and being a keyboard player and uh, just learning how to play all those songs on the keyboards and sort of uh, self-taught myself how to hear music. And okay. I got went to uh, to music school for a year. I took off. I have an aerospace degree, actually. Oh, wow. From okay. Drexel University in materials engineering. And mm -hmm. I took a year off, went to music school, learned about theory and composition, and came back and got to finish the degree up. So um, not knowing I was really going to be in the music business still. That was still a, kind of a pipe dream at the time. Was it your dream mm -hmm. to always be like a rock star? Because I've interviewed a lot of like either radio DJs or music producers, and they're like, well, you failed as a musician, so then you went the other direction, you know? Or... That's kind of the way it went. Yeah. I mean, I remember thinking uh, it, it was just too... Our, we, we probably had literally the worst band in Hollywood. <laughs> like, we played across the street from Motley Crue, I remember once, and it's funny because I just worked on the Motley Crue movie, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, these guys are like stated and they're never going to make it our band is great and we were it was the opposite you know we were terrible so uh but people liked the way the record the, the demo sounded that i made so i thought okay. i didn't really know what a producer was uh -huh. i just figured like oh i guess i must be the producer or something mm -hmm. and then it clicked what a great way to combine music the technology from my drexel stuff yeah not have to tour and not have to be the biggest thing was i didn't have to be at the behest of a lead singer so, and you watched, like, you know, if you weren't the lead singer, you were pretty much not in charge. Yeah. And I sort of, had, after being in a lot of bands and having lead singers, you know, and I found out they all had lead singer's disease later, we called that. You know? Yeah, I, I, I was so. in a bunch of bands, and after the last one that had LSD, I was like, I'm never going to be in a band again. Yeah. <laughs> I think that happens to well, most. Well, cool. How did, yeah. So how did you, you graduated? Like, how did you get your first um, producing gig? Well, I was out here. I came out and up to L.A. with my band, mm -hmm. which was dumb enough to follow me from Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we played for four years in the club. So I was, always, I was working at Garrett Air Research down in Torrance as a, as a mechanical engineer. So I had a real job. And uh -huh. in the evenings, I would just drive back from Torrance to play at Del Rey, change clothes into leather jackets, and go to Hollywood and play clubs and stuff. But um, after about four years or so of that, I just, I remember calling my parents and I was like, I'm gonna try and give this a shot because uh, people really like the way these demos sound. And so I just quit my job. It really, I mean, it, it surprised all my workers at the aerospace job because I actually was doing okay at the, like, yeah. you know, I was a good engineer. I wasn't like the greatest engineer in the building, but I liked it, I liked what I was doing. So it was a pretty big Hail Mary to quit that. You oh, know, yeah. I, I remember waking up on the next Monday having like literally nothing to do and not knowing what to do. So that was a pretty scary moment, you know. But I had made friends with an engineer who worked at Sunset Sound. And um, he wasn't an engineer, he was actually a runner. Okay. And he wanted somebody to produce music so he could learn how to engineer. And I needed somebody who worked at Sunset Sound. <laughs> because back good, then, it was, you, <laughs> it was a good trade off. And, yeah. and back then, you had to have friends in studios because there weren't studios, you know, like you, there were no such thing as home studios or Pro Tools studios or like things like that. So uh, became friends with him and started doing demos. And, you know, you starved for a long time. Uh, probably first record I produced was about five years after I quit my job. Oh, wow. So it was, big, yeah. it was a long time. I met my wife, Monica, mm -hmm. between all that. And um, I did a band called Tia. I, I actually met this band at Hollywood and Vine at the Denny's. So that stuff does actually happen. <laughs> so uh, they were actually sitting at the next table, and I heard them talking about them getting dropped from Enigma. And I just turned and just threw a, I threw a, that was a real Hail Mary. I was like, 
hey, I'm a producer. I'll, I'll finish your record. <laughs> Not having any idea how to do any of that. So, uh, that was the Revenge album? Yes. Wow. That's exactly right. That was the first one. So I actually took a half-made record that was half-produced, uh -huh. and I finished it, and um, then I had my first credit. Because I knew I sort of had this feeling I needed a credit. Like, you start figuring things out that that was sort of something that was missing from the resume. A lot of demos, no real credits. So uh, then the next record I did was their record a year later. Oh, wow. So the real record we did called Hit and Run. And then I did a bunch of jazz. I, th I remember thinking to myself, I can really uh, try to stay in a certain lane or just produce anything that comes to me. And I decided to pick the anything that comes to me lane. Yeah, I'm looking at you know? your Wikipedia and it's like all over the place. It's like you got metal. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, we did P.O.D., which is their biggest hit, you know? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm going to jump ahead to your career in 1998. One of my favorite best produced albums is Zebrahead, Waste of Mind. Like, I'm actually going to interview them later today. So if you have Are they here? Stories, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. you got to tell me when. I might have to, like, like crash that one. Four o'clock. So. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, I mean, that album was, like, start to finish so clean. You want to hear the story behind this? So I was actually going to this club called 369 uh -huh. that was in Orange County to see a band called Suction uh -huh. with the manager of Suction. We go down to see the band, and Zebrahead was opening for them. We had no idea who they were. Mm -hmm. But I remember driving back, in the, and I think the... Uh, Ali, the singer, gave me a demo tape. And we're in the car talking about suction. I put the tape in, I'm not kidding, and I went, that's the band we need to sign, not those other guys, you know? And the guy, the manager was like, we can't do that, we're here to see this. Like, it was such a crazy thought that we were gonna sign the other, talk oh, about so the other band. Them then, right? We ended up signing wow. it, well, we got them to sign, we signed them to Columbia, yeah, yeah. and we made the Yellow album, which was like sort of the demo album, which we did demos, and then we put out the Waste of Mind record after that. And then we did the Playmate. The one after that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Underrated album, I think. Yeah, right? and speaking of yeah. underrated, uh, one of my favorite bands of all time is Cold, and you did their biggest record, a Year of the Spiders. Yeah. And uh, what was it like that working with uh, them? Scooter was m out of his mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As my, Mike, who's here, can attest to. <laughs> yeah, Scooter was a bit crazy. He uh, he had come from the Jordan Scherr, Geffen, uh, Jacksonville world, where all those guys were really, really nuts. You know, but uh, we got him to write a song with um, Rivers Cuomo. Yeah, Stupid Girl. Stupid Girl. And it was interesting. That was when I was really, we were getting into Pro Tools big time at that point. That was okay. about my seventh or eighth record in Pro Tools. And I remember that there was no chorus in that song. But this, the vocal in the verse had, want a lover, want a Donna, stupid girl. So I took the stupid girls and moved them into the part at the end and made a chorus out of it and then it became their hit. Oh wow. <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, that was easy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was actually a pretty big moment because I remember thinking, well, I can actually fix a lot of these things like just by editing, you know. But I actually thought that was a really well done record by the band. Like they were that was their finest moment, I oh, thought. Oh yeah, yeah. You know. The Seattle Die has an amazing song. Great song. Oh, so the Seattle Die has a great keyboard solo which I played on. You that. did? Wow. <laughs> I was doing some Emerson Lincoln Palmer. I threw it in there cuz I didn't think they would even realize it was there. They were so <laughs> fucked up on drugs. So yeah. I was like, okay, I'll throw an Emerson Lincoln Palmer that's solo. That's kind of like Scooter in their downfall. I mean, yeah. Like every album I play everyone talks about that. Um Man, I just interviewed last week, May. You worked on one of their records. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember that. Do you remember me? <laughs> yeah, oh, my me. God. Oh, well, that's right. We did that. So we, yeah, I remember yeah. those guys. That was actually a group. I really enjoyed that. We had that song called Crazy Eights. And, mm -hmm. yeah, they were from uh, Charleston or something like that or North Carolina or something. Uh, Virginia Beach. Or Virginia Beach um, or something, yeah. Yeah. Um, they were in a bad situation because they got on Capitol. Right yeah. at the time, their A&R guy got fired, and it was just a, I remember that. They, that that's one. what they were talking about, yeah. But now they're back on two for now, so it's all good. Oh, great. Um, yeah, My Come Up Romance, like, Three Tears, Three Revenge. I love that album, because I always thought it had a little bit of cold in them, and then I saw that, like, you produced both their albums. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That uh, Gerard's just putting out the Umbrella Academy. Yeah, on Netflix. Big, so. It's a big deal for him. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy for him. It's like he's always wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Even while we were making the record, he was a comic book I mean, he drew all the artwork, yeah. and he was sort of uh, like, you know, that was a great, we had a lot of fun with that one. Did you think that was, like, was going to make them blow up at that point when you finished that album? You well, know, it was like... a very funny story about that, because I, when they, I first met them, they were just a bunch of kids from Newark. Yeah. And they were so unknown that when my son had his birthday party, we had him play laser tag. We just had him <laughs> come down to Van Nuys Boulevard, like nobody knew who they were, and they were just playing laser tag with everybody else. 
I remember making the record and we made a decision during the album to make a vocal oriented album. And that wasn't like anything they had done before. Yeah. But I threw harmonies on, and Gerard had never sung any of this stuff before. And I just went for it. I was like, Mike, I remember Mike and I, Mike had suggested doing a guitar harmonies and uh, I'm not okay. So they ended up ending up sounding like Queen only because that's where we were going without any thought of it being like that. Like uh -huh. we weren't trying to make that. That was just where the studio went at the time, you know? So well, that's amazing. when right. I do, yeah, and when I delivered it, I did not get a great reception from Ray and the rest of the band hated it because uh, all of a sudden they were like, "What's this pop album?" Like, <laughs> yeah, it was you know, a big jump it was a big jump. But the A and R guy, Craig Aronson, who's uh, was a good friend of mine, he passed away, but he was oh. the guy who supported us during the record. But I still didn't think they were going to be big. And Monica calls me from she goes to Warner Brothers and sees this massive poster of this band up on the front of the building. And she goes, did you produce a band called My Chemical Romance? I'm like, yeah. She goes, there was a massive, and I saw the picture on AP, which was the same picture. Didn't look like them. I mean, Gerard must have lost like 20 pounds. The band looked amazing. Like, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, what is this, who are these guys? Like, they weren't those guys in the studio. Uh -huh. You know, they were just a bunch of guys. They were just, you know, different, you know? So yeah, it was a pretty, Give them a lot of credit for shooting great videos too. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. Helena, I remember when I saw Helena, I thought, oh my God, that's a game changer, that one, you know? So, and I think the director went on to be a pretty famous director too, who did both those. Yeah, I can't know? remember his name, but. Um, he did my All American Rejects Move Along video, similar type of video. Yeah, I was gonna, I'll get into you know? that later, but let's jump to that now. Uh, <laughs> All American Rejects, that album was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Move Along, it's other big hits on it. So, uh, yeah. like working with those guys? And the uh, those guys were, um, it was a pretty straightforward record. Mm -hmm. um, we just got into big arguments at the end about Move Along. I remember that was a tough one because oh, wow. they didn't want the piano and the kids or any of that stuff. They didn't want the grandiosity of this song. Oh, and it I, makes the song so good. I know, <laughs> but, and that's why you have to fight it out sometimes at the end. Uh -huh. I'm at that position right now in another project I'm doing right now. It's always at the end of the project that it gets crazy. So. Um, and I think that um, Tyler or Tyson at yeah. the time was fairly like committed to making that record like that. They weren't yet the pop band they ended up being, mm -hmm. so we still made a rock album with them. And you know, I thought that record was great. You know, I had turned them down a year before, which uh, was interesting. I went to Atlanta, saw them play, and said, "No, I don't think your songs are good enough." And they got really pissed off, and they were like, "We're going to hire somebody else." <laughs> a year later, they called me and said, "You were right." And I respected them for that, for not just just making that album that they could have made. Mm -hmm. You know, they actually wrote all those songs in the in the interim. You know, so I remember coming back, and the first song I heard was "It Ends Tonight," and I thought, "Wow, yeah. holy cow, boy, these guys have written some songs." You know, so credit to them. That was, you know, another very underprivileged, I think, band and album. Which I, my first heard, I thought this was going to be huge, but Melee's Devils and Angels. I mean. That album start to finish. Yeah. Um, I think they did pretty well overseas, though. I think. Uh, you know, in Japan, Japan yeah. yeah. One of her writers wrote the single, actually. What was the single? Uh, the first, uh, the girls wrote it. It was the first song on the record. Um, I will look it up. I forget it, but it was the girls co wrote that one with them. Um, you know what happened with that project? Mm -hmm. The. Oh, the built to Last, yeah. Built to Last, I think that was it, or yeah, one of them. Built to Last, yeah. So we were ready to go to radio at Warner Brothers, and that's really hard to get a label to go to radio. Yeah. Like, if they want to go to radio, that means something's good, right? The manager of the band, I have no idea why, I think he was an amateur or something, he called the label up and said, we're, we're not prepared, we don't want to go to radio. This record does not sound like us. Um, Howard fucked our career up by making us into... Oh, my God. Yeah. That's what happened, I'm not kidding. Yeah. And they put a lot of that on, on, on me and, you know, of making them sound too good. And that happens sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, you, you try, that's why you hire me, is not to, like, be a cool, you, you want pits, you know? Yeah. So I think it was almost staring them in the face too much. It was, like, right on the nose, here's some hit songs, and they just weren't prepared. I've never heard that, had that happen in my whole career, where a manager has called a record company and said, we don't want to go to radio. Well, that's actually insane. I've seen them a bunch, they don't seem to seem to play that much from that album. It's weird, like, they're yeah. Now that makes sense. So. That makes sense, yeah. Is there any other bands like that that you have problems with? Or? The ones oh. that you've never heard of. Yeah, I guess so. Where did we get it? Well, I can talk to you all day because there's so. Actually, I've talked to a 
last week, because he did a Chris Cornell album. The one, you know, well, I did a song of his. Oh, a song. So how was it yeah. working with the Lakers? That was unbelievable. Yeah. And I think the song we did called Long Gone, mm -hmm. I think is an amazing song. I mean, I still listen to that song a lot. I think it's a, and it's a chilling lyric mm -hmm. in that song. And he was, we used him for that, and we used him to sing a whole lot of love on Santana's album. He did the vocal for that, yeah. the record we did. And when you solo his vocal, it's like nothing you've ever heard. It's just this amazing mid-range, almost papery sounding mm -hmm. vocal that's, uh, everything was fast. You know, when he produced himself, he, he was sort of self, he produced a lot of the Soundgarden stuff himself. Yeah. He spent tons of time on those vocals. I didn't spend that much time with him because he was great. He didn't know how great he actually was. You know, he overthought a lot in the studio. But his first or second takes, I think he sang a whole lot of love in two takes. And that was it. So that was the Santana one where we did all the covers. Yeah. So they did the, the well, I think it was a Chester did a song. But Chester, which is really weird. Yeah. They both did a song on that. Yeah. You know? And we were at his funeral, Cornell, and Chester sang at the funeral, and then the next thing you know, Chester yeah. <laughs> The whole thing was so weird, you know. Well, cool. Is there any upcoming projects, any bands that are unknown you want the public to get a hold of? Yeah, I'm doing a, um, I'm, let's see, we did Three Days Grace last year, which had, which will now be three number one songs. We have had yeah. two with them. And then we Which did uh, the mountain, infrared, infrared and, yeah. and right, left, wrong. I hear that all the time on Octane. <laughs> yeah, and then Joyous Wolf is a new band. But we're right in the middle of it, and that's a band on Roadrunner, and that's a band that's very much in the sort of Greta Van Fleet world of young, below twenty-year-old rockers who are very, you know, this is more like a Pearl Jam type of band as oh, a Led Zeppelin kind of throwback thing. So. Um, very excited about that, and uh, just finished up a band on Rise called Issues, and I did Palisade for Rise, which is just past a million views for their uh, their thing. And their, issues a lot of love. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we've been very busy. Uh, yeah, did I miss anything? I can't even remember what we did. <laughs> you know, so um, oh, Inflames. In Flames oh, we did Flames. last year. We did the last two In Flames records. We're, I did the Motley Crue movie that's coming out. Yeah. I did all the music for that. For the, uh, well, it's the redo of the music that they did back then. We had to make it sound like Motley Crue 1982. So it was did a bit of a challenge. Did you tell them about when you played across the street from them? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> they, I didn't have to work with them, actually. I had okay. to work with guys that sounded like them. Oh, gotcha. So, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. All right, well, thank cool. you so much. All right, man. Thank you so much, too.